Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, usually I strut around like a revivalist preacher. Um, uh, I'm not going to do that here because I'll trip over the cables and bump into the furniture. But can I check you can all hear me at the back? Is that okay? Fantastic. So to begin with, uh, picture yourself on a boat, on a river. Uh, or, uh, if you prefer, uh, you can remember what the Dormouse said. Feed your head. Feed your head. Um, or, uh, if you prefer, um, I am the Eggman. Uh, they are the Eggmen. I am the Warus. Goo 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 goo. Um, and already some of you have started to hum along in your heads. And if you are, that's because these little um, musical fragments do more than draw on our private memories. They also tap our collective memory. They remind us that over the last 150 years, a story about growing up has itself developed in, in strange and surprising ways. Uh, and what started off as an attempt to entertain three little girls in Victorian Oxford has become an important part of the story that we tell about ourselves. Um, in 1990, the New York Times uh, published an article about Alice, and the headline then was, That Girl is Everywhere. That Girl is Everywhere. Um, since then, she's become even harder to pin down. Um, if literary characters uh, can be national treasures, Alice definitely qualifies. Uh, according to the poet Robert Graves, Alice is, he said, uh, the prime heroine of our nation. So Alice then, as a, as a champion of, of sturdy British common sense in a bizarre, baffling world. Uh, but if she's a, a national treasure, she's also an international treasure. Um, you might think about the dozens of translations from Afrikaans to Zulu. This is one done recently in emoji, <laughs> um, uh, which reads, uh, you're all fluent in emoji, but I'll translate it for you anyway. Uh, and what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations. Mm. <laughs> or, uh, if not that, you might think about this, the huge bronze statue in New York Central Park, or this Disneyland's teacup ride, or, or um, a restaurant in Tokyo, uh, which features um, uh, caterpillar sushi rolls, uh, <laughs> mock turtle salads. Um, there's this, there's a, there's a whole office block um, in... Um, in London, recently opened, it includes a giant fiberglass white rabbit. Uh, and this, which is the Queen of Hearts boardroom. I don't know about you, if I was summoned to a meeting in a Queen of Hearts <laughs> I would be a little nervous. Um, so, and even if we're not talking about the Alice books, we use them to talk with. Yes, um, uh, they are supposedly the most uh, commonly quoted books in the English language after translations of the Bible. Uh, and Shakespeare, and it's hard to listen to a conversation or open up a newspaper without that door to Wonderland opening just a crack. It's curiouser and curiouser, uh, off with his head, galumphing, chortle. Um, you put all these examples together, and you quickly realise Alice is much more than just another literary character. She's something more like an escapologist. Every time we think we've managed to pin her down, she somehow manages to wriggle free. And just after her 150th birthday, well, she's still on the loose. So, the first question then is, why am I interested in her? Why me? Why her? It's not as if I have a secret wardrobe um, <laughs> full of long, long wigs and blue pinafore dresses. Some of you may, if you do, I'm not judging. It just happens that I don't. Um, nor have I ever been tempted to get one of those slightly disturbing tattoos you sometimes see, like this one, which looks like um, an outtake from Alien that's got mixed up with uh, a game of hide-and-seek. Um, there is, though, one confession I can share with you, which is that um, when I was about seven years old, um, when I was at school, uh, the local bully accused me of being a bookworm. And now you think, you know, go figure. Um, <laughs> at the time, uh, it backfired slightly because I didn't know what he meant. And the only way to find out was to read a little bit more. But <laughs> I still think the bully got it the wrong way round. Um, do we bury ourselves in books? No, no, no. Books bury themselves in us. 
They, they burrow into our hearts, uh, into our minds. They change how, how we feel and how we think. And any book can do this, and, and it can do it at any time. But it's the books that we read as children that really seem to stick. Uh, my colleague, uh, Catherine Rundle, um, puts it better than I can. Uh, in her recent book, uh, Rooftoppers, um, in Rooftoppers, uh, Catherine says, when, when you're a child, books crowbar the world open for you. Um, books crowbar the world open for you. Once they've done that, the world might remain a place that's full of possibility and full of surprise. And of course, any book can do this, and at any stage. But, but it is the books that we read as children that really stick. In my case... The book was this, <coughs> Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Opening the cover of the book was like opening the door into the world of reading, into a wonderland of words. Um, and just as Alice discovers that Wonderland isn't, isn't really a place, it's a state of mind, so this story introduced me, like many other people, to the power of the imagination to transform the world. So the first big question then is how did a real girl called Alice become a fictional character called Alice? And how did such a small book end up becoming such a huge presence in our culture? Well, in the story, the caterpillar asks Alice, who are you? And she doesn't seem quite sure. Uh, I hardly know, sir, just at present. Uh, at least I know who I was when I got up this morning, uh, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. <coughs> and that kind of confusion, of course, is understandable, because over the course of her adventures, she is at different times mistaken for a serpent uh, and a monster and a flower and a housemaid. Um, she grows uh, as, as tall as a tree. She shrinks to the size of a mouse. And she reminds us then that one person has the potential to be many different things. But if there is just one common thread that links all these changes together, uh, it is probably the idea of doubling. Both of the Alice books are obsessed uh, with twins and with hybrids, uh, from the Mock Turtle uh, to Humpty Dumpty, uh, from... Uh, puns, to portmanteau words, tweedledum, tweedledee. And central to all this fictional mirroring and doubling is, of course, the figure of Alice herself. Uh, it's not just that Carol wrote two books about Alice. There were two Alices. There was the fictional version that we still know best from these illustrations by John Tenniel, um, uh, that pert little seven-year-old girl who is, at different times, uh, uh, sweet, and she's spiteful, uh, and she's kind, and she's careless, and she is then like a real girl. <coughs> a real girl who's been somehow caught up in a world of make-believe. But of course there was also the real Alice, Alice Liddell, here in Oxford, one of the sisters for whom Carol originally told the story in 1862. That girl that we now know best really through photographs like this one, the begging maid, where she stares straight out at the viewer, out of us, with that, that, that neat little bob and that troubling and ambiguous stare. Um, one of the reasons that Carol liked photography so much, I think, was because it was another way of doubling up the world. It turned ordinary life inside out. In a photographic negative, left was right, right was left, and black was white, and white was black. Uh, a gnat could grow to the size of a giant. But if Carol was obsessed with twinning and doubling, that might also have been because they went right to the heart of his own identity as an author. And I say that because in some ways Carol was like a, a pair of strangers who happened to share one skin. As Lewis Carroll, the author, he wandered through life with a head full of stories. 
and a pocket full of puzzles. As the Reverend Charles Dodgson, a rather plodding mathematician at Christ Church, well, the relationships he found much more interesting were found in algebra. In public, he upheld all the doctrines of the established church. In private, he devoured books about magic and the supernatural. Uh, as a friend to dozens, perhaps hundreds of children, uh, he stuffed his cupboards in Christchurch <coughs> with enough um, toys uh, and puzzles <coughs> to stock a small toy shop. Left alone in his rooms, uh, he busied himself writing letters of complaint uh, about what time the window cleaners turned on, um, or how his cauliflower was cooked. And since his death, uh, he's attracted myths in much the same way an old wardrobe attracts moths. Uh, for instance, um, did he really spend his leisure hours tripping out on psychedelic drugs? No, no evidence he did. Uh, was he really Jack the Ripper? <laughs> if you laugh, there's a whole book that says he was on the rather slim evidence that if you take some of the letters from some of his letters and you rearrange them and you take some out <laughs> and others in, and the fact that he was often in London, well. Um, but no, 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 there's no evidence he was Jack the Ripper. Um, so what was he like? Um, well, uh, socially he was uh, gregarious and warm and witty. He was also shy and cold and was prickly. Uh, he was almost obsessively neat and orderly, but also almost obsessively playful and silly. Uh, he was uh, something like an anarchic conservative. Uh, he was a traditionalist who had a taste for mayhem. Uh, he enjoyed creating miniature worlds, uh, not just uh, photographs, but also poems. Uh, puzzles, and, and this. This is an example of one of his letters sent to a child friend in what he called fairy writing. Um, there's another one where he sends ever so much love to a girl, and it's about four inches high. Ever so much love. Four inches. A joke? Or something other than a joke? And he liked pulling things apart and then putting them back together again. Uh, jigsaw puzzles? Yes. Also individual words. For instance, he collected um, uh, anagrams. He collected anagrams of the Prime Minister's name, William Ewart Gladstone, uh, which included, wild agitator means well. Uh, and a wild man will go at trees. William Ewart Gladstone. A wild man will go at trees. Um, he was fascinated by new inventions. Uh, which included Charles Babbage's early version of the computer, which he tried to buy. He collected inventions, uh, which included an organet, uh, a velociman, patented pens and pencil sharpeners, a typewriter with a curved keyboard, and this. This is a likely exerciser designed to keep Victorian fitness fanatics in trim and likely muscle. Um, if you've read uh, Ulysses, You'll remember that Leopold Bloom has a whitely exerciser. He says it's increased the size of his biceps by an inch. His how when he died had two whitely exercises, presumably one for each bicep. Um, on the other hand, uh, some of Lewis Carroll's <coughs> social thinking wasn't always quite so progressive. Uh, so a, a scandal about child prostitutes uh, broke in the news in 1885. And Carol wrote to the Prime Minister to intervene. To help the children? No, no, no. To stop the stories being printed in case they corrupted other still innocent children. Uh, he was keen on establishing uh, an all women's university. But he also wrote to the mother of one of his friends uh, Several of my girlfriends have been seriously affected by the modern craze of excessive brain stimulation. <laughs> Again, a joke, or something other than a joke, something more than a joke. Um, he also had mixed feelings about his own fame. Uh, he loved to um, meet new children, often at the seaside or on trains, and then would send them copies of his books, so uh, retrospectively revealing himself as a ta-da, Lewis Carroll, uh, like a superhero stripping off his disguise. Uh, this, by the way, is one of his own childhood illustrations to one of his handmade family magazines. 
Um, but at the same time, he hated journalists snooping around him. Uh, he returned letters written to Lewis Carroll, often with not known, written across the, uh, the envelope. Um, he told one friend that um, there is one thing I cannot stand, and that is to be pointed out as, that's the man who wrote Alice in Wonderland. <coughs> this is the same man who signed Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll. So, so who was he then? Well, like most people, he was a jumble of contradictions. Unlike most people, though, he found a way of reconciling all his own differences. And he did that by putting them into a story. And that story, of course, was Alice Murchers in Wonderland. And I say reconciling his differences because Wonderland is a place where logic slams up against nonsense. It takes rules, and it takes them seriously, and it turns them inside out and upside down. And it also shows that Carol wasn't content merely to photograph little girls. He wanted to get inside their heads and have a look around. Exactly. <laughs> just summed up 150 years of Lewis Carroll. Um, uh, he wanted to do what people often talk about doing, but very rarely managed to do, which is to write like a dream. He wanted to literally write like a dream. Now, the question, though, which I'm going to end with is, why would anyone still want to read his stories? Especially when there are so many modern uh, worlds on the page you might want to visit instead. Why would anyone still want to go back to Wonderland instead of visiting Narnia or Discworld or Oz? And the simple answer, I think, is that, that when we read about Alice, we're really reading about ourselves. Um, and what I mean by that is that although Carol would write a sequel in 1871 that sent Alice through a looking glass. Over 150 years, she's become a kind of cultural looking glass. Uh, like those funfair mirrors you used to get that, that show distorted versions of whatever you put in front of them. Alice has been used to reflect distorted versions of pretty much everything that we throw in front of them. The suffragette movement, the effects of LSD, everything. And Wonderland has also expanded its borders. Um, since, since 1865, um, uh, well, the afterlife and the unconscious uh, and the scientific world, these have all been described as different kinds of Wonderland. Um, this is a poster from um, a theatre I discovered in the Whitechapel Road. It's now been pulled down. Uh, a programme which uh, included, uh, as you see, a man with a very long beard, um, the armless midget lady, uh, a crack squad of performing pigeons. Um, that was Wonderland. Uh, today, what is Wonderland? Probably this. Wonderland now is the internet. Um, some of you might have seen or heard of a new musical uh, by Moira Buffini and Damon Albarn. Um, which is uh, the National Theatre. And the conceit of that is that uh, these days you don't have to go very far to fall down a rabbit hole because we almost all carry one around inside our pocket. You certainly do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the screen of a smartphone uh, has become a, a kind of <coughs> portal into a world that's full of disguises and games and challenges every bit as surprising as the one that Carol invented. So Wonderland, then, has become WWW, Underland. Um, and, and, and at the same time, Carol's story, um, in its own form, on the page, not just in terms of its digital afterlife, it too retains its power to tease, to unsettle, everything that we usually take for granted. I said something earlier about its interest in splitting and doubling. The best example of this is probably how it manages to be two stories in one. For child readers, it's a way of coming to terms with 
the adult world as a place that is um, strange and surprising and full of unexpected terrors, but also sometimes full of surprises <coughs> and pleasures, joys even. For adult readers, well, opening the cover of the book is a bit like stepping inside a personal TARDIS. You get transported back in time. Uh, Virginia Woolf put it much better than I can. She said that the Alice books might have been written for children. They are, though, she said, perhaps the only books in which we become children. In other words, once we've visited Wonderland, just once, we know where the door is. And then all we have to do is to make ourselves small enough to get through it again. Thank you. Right, well, thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Um, it's a bit like deja vu, because last year uh, we held a torch event on Tolkien uh, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of The Lord of the Rings, and I chaired that, but now I've been asked to speak on him this time. But at the time, I did comment that when the um, Return of the King came out, 61 years ago now, uh, Tolkien did actually sort of surmise that perhaps this was only the beginning of something. So what I'd like to do in, in my talk is talk about the afterlife of uh, Tolkien's books and works uh, in two particular areas. One, in terms of dramatisations of his works, and secondly, in terms of games, which is something which often people snigger at and, and neglect, but is actually extremely important. And at the end, I'm going to try and bring them all together. Um, and like so many things in the digital world, you really have to start in the analogue world first to really understand it. So... Let's start with dramatizations. You're probably all very familiar with some quite recent dramatizations over the past at least 15 years by Peter Jackson, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, but the first attempt to dramatize Tolkien's works uh, actually was by the BBC for radio in the mid-1950s. And radio, in many ways, offered the really only opportunity for people to work with Tolkien's works. And because, if you think about it, with a few dodgy sound effects and a bit of music, you can pretty much convey all of Middle-earth to the listening public. Um, the main problem with radio was, how do you get this massive work, something like The Lord of the Rings, into a, a series which people would listen to? Um, well, they tried. The Fellowship of the Ring was dramatised into six parts, and it, was a, it came out as a Christmas treat from November to December of 1955. Um, but the rest of the story, they then actually bundled up into just a further six episodes. The whole of the two towers gets dished off in uh, three episodes and the return of the king in another three. And Tolkien was not too happy with this. Uh, in fact, he did comment that he didn't think the Lord of the Rings could ever be dramatised because it needed a lot of space. Now, those episodes have been lost, unfortunately, but the script does survive um, in the BBC archives and of the Fellowship of the Ring at least. And very interestingly, after each episode, there's a report that they went out and talked to readers and said, were we holding your attention? What didn't you understand? And so forth. And that may have led to the uh, truncation to the final three episodes for the next two books. Other dramatisations of The Hobbit followed on radio and so forth, but perhaps for many of us, for some of you in the audience, uh, the, the groundbreaking event was Brian Sibley and Michael Bakewell's 1981 version of The Lord of the Rings for the BBC, which actually was 24 episodes. They then brought it into 12 episodes of one hour each. Uh, and indeed, as I've, I've written about, this probably was the, the single thing which got me into Tolkien to begin with. When it comes to film and television, the story uh, or to attempt to visualise Tolkien's works um, is worthy probably of a PhD dissertation in itself. Um, the first attempt to screen something by Tolkien uh, was in 1967. It was uh, of The Hobbit. It was made by one William Snyder, and it received one showing. One showing in a cinema. It wasn't because it wasn't any good, but they just had to show it to satisfy a legal contract that they then uh, claimed some rights over the book. And the problem with filming Tolkien, until we get to the digital world, is really the issue of scale. There's the landscape that he paints in Middle-earth, there are the cities. But if you think about it, there's the number of people in the battles which we have to deal with. The Battle of Pelennor Fields in Return of the King is estimated to have about 50,000 people in it. Um, and probably if you think about the great battles on film, we've got Dino de Laurentiis' um, Laurentiis's Waterloo of 1970, which had about 20,000. 
Uh, it's true, Sergei Bondarchuk's War and Peace from 1966 had 100,000 extras, um, but he had the entire Red Army at his disposal, uh, and he only had to dress them as Napoleonic soldiers. He didn't have to dress some of them as orcs, trolls, or get some elephants in there. And then you also think about the scale of people. How do you film a troll standing next to a hobbit? The troll's easy. You just get a bloke in a giant rubber suit. But then if you've got a hobbit standing next to it and an elf and a man in between, you've got some real problems. So it's, it's understandable that the, really the only recourse was animation, either through something like Disney or uh, something like a Ray Harryhausen model. But that is extremely expensive. Nevertheless, quite a few companies are interested, including Disney, including the Beatles. I'm sure you've heard about this. The Beatles wanted to make a version of The Lord of the Rings with uh, Paul as Frodo. Um, and in 1969, Tolkien actually signed a contract with the United Artists. Um, and it is one of the uh, most extraordinary contracts in film history. And um, because it said that the uh, filmmakers had the right to add to and subtract from the work or any part thereof that they had uh, the right to make sequels to and new versions of adaptions of the work or any part thereof, to use any part or parts of the work or the theme thereof, any instance, characters, character names, scenes, sequences or characterizations therein. Basically, they could do whatever the hell they wanted to with anyone that appeared in any of the books in Middle-earth in perpetuity. And I'll come back to why that's quite important in the digital age. Um, Continuing with the film works, uh, there was a 1977 version of The Hobbit which came out on TV, but then the one that which probably you may have seen was Ralph Bakshi's 1978 um, film version of The Lord of the Rings. Now I've got a clip from it here, I hope. Um. <clears throat> Can't hear it, but that's not to worry. These are the orcs attacking uh, Helm's Deep, and it may, you can just see the sort of quality of uh, the film that we're, we're looking at here. It's pretty poor stuff, and it's using a technique called rotoscoping, where they filmed people walking along, and then some guy in an animation studio just drew over it. Uh, and clearly, their budget didn't extend much to costumes, because some of the orcs obviously have their uh, horned, uh, horned helmets on or they're wrapped in sheets with welding goggles or something like that. Um, unfortunately, uh, Ralph Bakshi only got halfway through uh, and, and then stopped, so we don't actually have the second film to, to complete the story. Uh, and there were hopes raised when a, a 1980 a version of The Return of the King came out in animation, but this was so bad and so uh, confused Unless you were taking some mind-bending drugs, you just had no idea what was going on. And it was probably the clue was in the fact that in Variety it was billed as Frodo the Hobbit 2. Um, it was, of course, the advent of digital technologies that allowed us really to re realise uh, Middle Earth and at the hands, capable at times at least, by Peter Jackson with his Lord of the Rings trilogy, which came out in 2001 to 2003. And the digital techniques provided answers to a lot of questions. We could do the scale. We could have hobbits standing next to dwarves, next to elves, next to men. We could do the scenery, Gondor, Moria, Helm's Deep, etc. They actually built models on a one-to-four scale of some of those scenes, which is quite extraordinary. And we had animations. We used CGI. Particularly, you're probably well aware that Gollum is actually Andy Serkis performing, and then they uh, overlaid that with um, some... Uh, some digital technology so you could realise Gollum. And then finally, in the battle scenes, they actually created a, a piece of software called Massive where they could individually code into an agent, an individual orc or whatever in the battle, um, some choices. So they could then run the program and then the battle would happen and the orc could say, right, I'm going to run over that way. And they would collectively feed off each other. So you could at, re, re, replicate a battle with all these types of people. And... Um, I'll just show you if I've got some clips from it here. Again, don't have the sound. Some, oh, dear. Oh, we do have sound. So you're getting a lot of live footage here, but you are getting... Now, I'd like to change track a bit and look at games very briefly, um, uh, because this is another way that, that Tolkien's world has been reimagined. And it may surprise you to know that there are about 140 board games based on Tolkien's works, starting with The Conquest of the Ring, which um, came out in 1970, which I've never played. Now, 140 does include Tolkien trumps and Monopoly sets, but the bulk of them are actually trying to do something with the, uh, the books themselves. Um, when you look at them, what they're trying to do, there are board games which are basically centred around the quest in The Hobbit, 
The Lord of the Rings, where you have an individual, a character or a set of characters trying to go and do something. There are games set around one of the battles, the great battles, in um, Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. Um, and indeed, something which I'll talk about in a second, some of the uh, figure battle rule sets that came out in 1971 went on to something much more important. And then there are games which attempt to sort of combine both, where here, this is the War of the Ring. Um, so you've got a map of Middle Earth, and you, you move armies around, and the bottom right hand are counters of armies. Um, but then on the left, you've also got the, uh, the individual characters trying to move about. So you're trying to sort of move massive armies around as well as get these individual hobbits and characters roaming around. The biggest problem with these games is that someone has to play the role of Sauron. Um, <laughs> that may sound odd, but what I mean by that is, in the book, of course, Sauron does not know that the objective is to destroy the ring. He thinks they're going to take the ring off and try and use it and, and, and blast it to bits. But as soon as you start playing this as a Sauron, and you see these little pieces making a beeline over the mountains towards Mordor, you've got a fairly good idea that's the ring bearer. <laughs> so you move all your armies that way and ignore the sort of little fracas going on in Gondor. And that's not something which you could, you could get over very easily. The other area which came out in games is role-playing games. Um, and these are quite interesting. And perhaps probably the best known of these is um, Dungeons & Dragons, which uh, emerged from Chainmail in 1971 and was first published in 1974 um, by uh, Gary Gygax and others. And I actually met Gary Gygax, and he had a discussion with him about the formation of this game, uh, which was extremely interesting. But throughout interviews with, with Gygax, he says, actually, no, the Lord of the Rings really wasn't that great an influence on um, his role-playing games. But, and you can kind of see that to a way, because when you play these games, you're larger-than-life figures, whereas in the Lord of the Rings, I think the figures are much more subtle, uh, the characters like Aragorn aren't really superheroes that go in and just blast away loads of people, and, apart from the films. But towards the end of his life, Gary Gygax did actually reply to an interview and he, uh, on The Lord of the Rings and said, how did it influence the D&D game? Well, plenty, of course. Just about all the players were huge JRRT fans, and so they insisted that I put as much Tolkien influence material into the game as possible. Anyone reading this that recalls the original D&D game will know that there were Balrogs, Ents, and Hobbits in it, and indeed there were. And the same you could probably say for Games Workshop's Warhammer. And you can probably guess why. There are a lot of dungeons and adventures in Tolkien which really play into the idea of what these games were doing, where you often go down to some subterranean world to complete a quest. And once um, these had taken hold, it's only a matter of time before a set of rules came out that was devoted to Middle Earth. There you are, the Middle Earth role-playing game. You cannot believe the enjoyment I had of going into my attic and digging that out. <laughs> I relieved my youth. Um, let's now move to the digital world computer games um, and say a few words about that. Actually, the first computer game really, if you talk about, goes back to the 1970s with Advent or Adventure, um, which was kind of based on sort of interactive fiction, where you make choices and you move around. And from that came some mainframe computer games like Moria and Orthanc in 78, and, uh, both in 1978. And that is Moria. I have no idea. I never played this, but I, I, I'm guessing that is probably the original game. But the one, again, many people remember is The Hobbit, which came out in 1982 for the Spectrum. Um, it, there were two frustrating things about 1982. One was England getting knocked out of the World Cup, uh, Kevin Keegan missing a header, and the second was this game, because it ate up hours of your life. And you can possibly see why, because it was very text interactive, and you can see on the right, see Curious Map, I do not know the word C, look Curious <laughs> Map, and you just were struggling with all these sort of words to try and get the game to progress. Uh, this was followed by 1986 by The Fellowship of the Ring and then The Shadows of Mordor in 1987. Uh, and then finally, Electronic Arts released a CD-ROM based set of games on The Lord of the Rings, which were basically role-playing. But interestingly enough, they had clips from the Ralph Bakshi film in there, albeit 12 years later. And like so many things, though, it all comes back to Jackson's films, 2001 to 2003, because once they came out, a rash of games came out. Uh, for the PS2 and the like. And this is where the contract comes in, because if you remember that contract that they signed in 1969, it basically said you can do whatever you want with any of the characters in this book, and you can write sequels and so forth. And that's really what led to this explosion of games following The Lord of the Rings and, of course, now The Hobbit. Um, 
Interestingly, it also led to Lord of the Rings Online, a, a multi-user player game, where you, it's free to use, you go online, you set up a character, and basically you become part of this enormous world. Now, this cursory examination of a reimagine, reimaginations of Tolkien suggests to me something extraordinary is going on here. Because, of course, there are numerous dramatizations of Alice, of all kinds of writers, and so we can't really say that Tolkien's unique there. But what we might want to say is, why were the films so phenomenally successful? Um, partly, I think this is due to Peter Jackson. He does some things extremely well on the scale of the films. But also, presumably, there was a massive appetite for them. Outside of Bakshi, we had not seen a good film version, particularly a live film version, of one of the most popular books of the 20th century. Um, and why are there so many games, though? Why are there 140 or 100 games, if you move away from the monopoly, about Tolkien? Um, so I would just like to finish by saying there's a few things here I'd suggest. First, Tolkien stories, of course, lend themselves very nicely to a game. They're a quest. You're about, you've got to go and do something. So there's an obvious objective and a way of winning. Second, I think Tolkien built a world describing in meticulous detail the flora, fauna, and history. And this is an absolute godsend to a games designer. You've got your rules there and then. Your maps, you can just put the hexagonals over. You've got your board. And you've got everything else about you might want to know about what it is to be a Rohirrim or, a, or an orc or whatever, and what things they eat and don't eat and so forth. And that is, I think, a testimony to the depth of Tolkien's vision. You can't, for example, imagine, at least I can't imagine, a fantasy role-playing game based on Narnia. And um, third, within these games, there, within these stories, there, there might well be one. <laughs> Sorry, I point out, but I, don't, I didn't play it if there was. Um, within these stories, there are easy sub-games. There's mini-quests, there's battles, things you can easily pick off. Uh, but then finally, I think there is something else which I just want to finish on. And that is what I believe are the enchantment of Tolkien's works, the secondary belief they conjure when you read, as he described it. And it allows you then to play a game set in his mythology, which, in which you can immerse yourself <laughs> thoroughly in that world. We can all picture the landscape because we've read the books or seen the films, but mainly because he describes it so meticulously. And this, in this, I'm reminded of Tolkien's own comments in his essay on fairy stories, and he was talking there about something which he'd seen in folk tales called fairy and drama. It's a particular aspect of folk tales where the, the human protagonist somehow gets taken into the fairy world, into enchantment, and goes into this and is fully immersed. As he said, they can produce these fairy and dramas, a realism and immediacy beyond the compass of any human mechanism. As a result, their usual effect is to go beyond secondary belief. You yourself are or think you are bodily inside its secondary world. And I think that's what's happening with some of these games. Fairy and drama for Tolkien was quite sinister. Think of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. But in the case of the games, it's obviously a lot more positive. So, to conclude, what next? Well, the desire to immerse yourself in Middle Earth knows no bounds. Um, this is what you would call live action role playing. I kid you not, uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe, I can't quite remember, almost on a festival scale, not Glastonbury, but let's say truck fest scale, um, people assemble and dress up like that and beat the hell out of each other and uh, reenact Tolkien's battles. Um, so the desire there is, is, is quite uh, extraordinary. But I think the computers will probably provide that for us. Virtual reality is the next big thing one can imagine. And if we think of where computers are now compared with 1982, that Hobbit game, you can imagine where they'll be in 10 years' time um, through VR systems. So you will be able to go into Middle Earth, immerse yourself, um, you can also see a mishmash, maybe, of film productions, which you're in part of. You can change the linear narrative of the film. You can be a person in the book. You can be an observer. You could change the story. You could have your own adventures. It's a bit like, I was beginning to think of Aldous Huxley's feelies when I was writing this passage, and I thought, well, they'll never happen. And then I read a, uh, an article this week, they're actually going to happen. They've developed the technology for cinemas to replicate feelies. So uh, many people have tried to guess what Tolkien himself would have made of all this. Um, I've no idea. I think all I can say is that the afterlife of his works is quite extraordinary. And I'll leave you with a quote from 1971 um, from a letter from Tolkien, where he said, of course, the Lord of the Rings does not belong to me. It has been brought forth and now must go its appointed way in the world, though naturally I take a deep interest in its fortunes as a parent would of a child.
this time, the response came instantaneously. A stream of dancing lights, for all the world like the shimmering curtains of the aurora blazed across the stream. They took up patterns that were held for a moment only to break apart and form again in different shapes or different colours. <coughs> they looked, they swayed, they sprayed apart. They burst into showers of radiance that suddenly swerved this way or that like a flock of birds changing direction in the sky. And as Lyra watched, she felt the same sense, as of trembling on the brink of understanding that she remembered from the time when she was beginning to read the Alethiometer. I'm pretty sure there's one person, at least in the audience, who might remember where that's from. <laughs> but um, if anyone wanted to shout it out, I'd be perfectly happy. It's from the moment in the second book of the trilogy where we're looking at the computer screen in Mary Malone's office. So this is the moment where dust goes digital, if you like. And although I'm not going to be discussing adaptations of um, Coleman's work in that sense, I wanted to use this, this idea of his appreciation of technological skill and of different types of media that function across time, across place, and across, across discipline. So this is where the elementary particles of Lyra's world touch the pixels of a computer screen. And to identify that embrace of a digital interface within his dark materials is to turn attention to a really remarkable chapter, I think, chapter four of The Subtle Knife, Trepanning. It's a very carefully plotted and a very carefully paced chapter. It tells us of Will and Lyra's experiences on a day in Oxford, when Will is seeking information relating to his father's disappearance, and Lyra is looking for a scholar who can explain to her some more about dust. I think it's close to our hearts if we're enjoying the novels. It's literally close to us geographically while we sit here today because the scholar that Lyra finds, Mary Malone, is situated on South Parks Road, somewhere in the science block. And it's not just that. The connections between worlds and universes will take us even closer to our current location because this chapter, Trepanning, will move us through the centre of Oxford and take us quite literally into the Natural History Museum and track us through into the back of this museum, into the slightly more dusty space of the Pitt Rivers. So this chapter is integral, I think, to the ways in which the connection of worlds and of universes and of ways of seeing are so significant to the development across the trilogy. It's weaving plot lines and thematic threads of likeness and of difference. It's playing with ways of defamiliarizing contexts and behavioral norms. So we can compare and contrast the experience of Will and Lyra in an Oxford which belongs to one of them but not the other. We can compare and contrast the viewpoints of Lyra and Mary um, from different worlds but also somebody who uses a vocabulary that might sound moral or religious talking of good and evil and somebody who wishes to talk about science. We can compare and contrast the locations of a museum and a science laboratory. We can think about dust or we can think about physics. We can think about the old, we can think about the new. We can think about then, we can think about now, we can think about there, we can think about here. But what we think we probably, as readers, delight in most in this particular chapter is Lyra's evaluation of what she finds in the museum. So she walks through the natural history section of this particular museum and is then found in this quieter space of the Pitt Rivers, which, which is a museum, as you probably know, of man-made things, of man-made objects. And we delight, I think, in Lyra's slightly um, ambivalent evaluation of the museum exhibit of <coughs> Arctic artifacts. And we do so partly because of our shared knowledge as readers of the Svalbard ex experiences and adventures from the first book. So there we have this rather pert uh, young character looking at the museum exhibit. Well, how strange. 
Those caribou skin furs were exactly the same as hers, but they tied the traces on that sledge completely wrong. So we've been brought to this museum space, um, but we're being asked to encounter these particular physical objects in, in, in a new way, to see them as objects of use, um, not simply as things that will gather dust behind glass, but rather things that will attract dust with a capital D, because we are either using them, thinking about them, engaging with them. So the Pitt Rivers, which begins as something of a treasure trove, I think, on your first experience of that particular um, space, a cabinet of curiosities, if you like, is now being seen via Lyra and via our reading experience of her Arctic adventures as a way of re-evaluating um, that kind of display. We are beginning to use the collection, if you like, and this is a very playful thing because I think we can, to some extent, assume that one of the things that the author did while he was looking around in that magpie way for raw materials to um, employ within his own text might well have been to stumble into the Pitt Rivers Museum and have a very good look at its rifle selection for Lee Scoresby and have a very good look at what it was doing and saying both about skulls and about uh, Arctic exhibits. And the way in which we then find that in Lyra's world, which is the authorial world, we tie knots and we tie the strips together differently from the way that it is found in the museum exhibit where we potentially might find the start of one of the storylines that takes us into the wonderland of his dark materials is another way in which we are using material and reusing material and resourcing objects of use. And of course, the Pitt River Museum is not simply a space for treasure trove curiosity. It's an active, educative space for the study of anthropology, for the study of humanity and of our story. So to bring Lyra to this space and with her to bring the reader to this space is offering us an exceptionally rich interface with a number of different communicative moments. So the study of humanity, of our evolution as a species, but also of our relation with the material world over time and locale, happening in this particular chapter, trepanning. Trepanation, the practice of making a hole in the skull to improve brain pulsations. And yes, I did take that off the web. Um, could be done for your health, or could be done as the shaman in um, this particular set of novels is said to have done it for spiritual reason, to bring the gods in. So we have in this chapter, Trepanning, the move from this location, from the Pitt Rivers uh, here, to the science labs on South Parks Road. And within the plot lines, or if, if you like, the props almost, of this particular chapter, we move from the fascination that Lyra has with the Japan skull and the way in which she gives that so much of her attention to try to work out the dating, the age of that particular skull and the dust that is attracted to it. Um, against the fact that she's not seeing the current danger, uh, Sir Charles Latham, who's kind of coming in and watching her kind of voyeur, um, one, of, one of many moments when we might be thinking about Paradise Lost and a kind of satanic figure looking on at innocence. But it's not just that we have that particular prop of the Trepan skull. We watch with Lyra as she moves into the science area where her cranium will be linked up to a computer through pressure pads that are being placed upon her skull. So we very much have this sense across time and this sense across humanity of using different methods of communication, different methods of opening up doorways to the spirit world or doorways to other means of expanding thought, experience, human consciousness, human knowledge. And of course, both this trepanned skull and this moment when <coughs> Mary can hook Lyra up to uh, the, the, the computer and she will make the, 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 the pixels dance, dust will, will, will respond to her brainwaves. 
they both require certain types of, of technical skill. And I think this is something that Pullman is very engaged with and very, very good at doing, the practical side to art. And when I'm using the word technology, I am thinking of it as a type of art form. You need tools to do prana skull. You need tools to write code to run a computer program. You need tools to design and to craft an alethiometer. And it seems to me that this particular author loves to introduce that materiality, that tactility of a crafted object of use. So something that, again, is not left behind the glass screen of the museum to gather dust, but something which is in your hands, attracting, <coughs> capital D, dust. And that is part of an anthropological exercise, seems a major part of what's going on in these particular novels. And I guess what I'd like to do is sort of just push that idea a little bit further and talk a little bit about the way in which that making and shaping and making an object of use. And of course, Mary Malone um, use, using the, the lens and working with that to make the amber spyglass is going to be the most obvious example from within the novels. I guess I want to push that just a little bit further and think a little bit about authorship. Um, think a little bit about the making as a process um, the way that that's put within the novels, so making becomes part of the plot lines of these novels, of making and of mending and of resourcing materials. Something to do with our cultural memory and inheritance there. But what happens when we actually take that to the idea of authorship as making and as memory? And in that activity, we might think of maturation as being part <coughs> of the process. Of course, we're thinking about that with these novels. They're novels of adolescence. They're novels of growing up in much the same way as, as Alice in Wonderland might be said to be. But I think I would want to think about also the reader's relationship to the book and whether there's a maturation process within that or whether one could be developed. Um, and whether also there <coughs> might potentially be a maturation of the author's relationship to his books. The three novels of his Dark Materials are published for the first time between 1995 and the year 2000. But in 2007, a new edition comes out of his Dark Materials, which includes for the first time new extra sections, lantern slides, little snippets of text on one page. Um, specifically, Pullman says that this is not a rewrite of um, his own work, it's not an adaptation of it, it's simply an opportunity to play. And what he's doing is finger posting ways in to the ways in which other stories might just state within the printed text. He's filling in some gaps, but he's also intensifying our curiosity about others. These are snapshots, these are photograms, these are freeze frames, but we know that all we have to do is hit that pause button one more time to make it play. That kind of sense of using a technology that might begin with early ideas about photography, might begin with magic lanterns, might begin with lantern slides, and lead us right the way through to some of the things that my colleagues have been showing you earlier on this evening. So what's happening with lantern slides is not just encouraging you to buy another um, edition of the novels, it's also encouraging the curious. And it's something which is playful, and actually it's something which is relaxed in that way in which we're so encouraged with these novels to relax into communication. But it's also, I think, potentially offering us new ways of insight into what's going on in novels. And my apologies at this point for not showing you, deliberately not showing you, a digital image. But I want to take you with me, if I can, into these lantern slides as a visual as well as as a piece of text. So when you're in the 2007 edition, there's really rather a handsome, uh, decorative little illustration in pen and ink of what the, um, the, the, the magic lantern might look at, like. And we follow that up with Pullman's own text, talking about why he's introduced the lantern slides. As for why I called these little pieces lantern slides, it's because I remember the wooden boxes my grandfather used to have each one packed neatly with painted glass slides showing scenes from Bible stories or fairy tales. From time to time, he would get out the heavy old magic <coughs> lantern and project some of these pictures onto a screen. And we would sit in the darkened room with the smell of hot metal and watch one scene succeeding another, trying to make sense of the narrative. 
and wondering what St. Paul was doing in the story of Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> because they never came out of the box in quite the right order. I think it was my grandfather's magic lantern that Lord Asriel used in the second chapter of Northern Lights. And the crafting of that is, I think, majestic and magnificent. The way in which it honours the past and uses the present to gesture us back to materials that we know already from the texts and plays with this question of likeness and, and similarity against things which have become defamiliarised and offers to, uh, to a generation like ourselves a nostalgic memory of past technologies. And it is quite pristine, isn't it, that idea of actually the weight of the magic lantern and the smell of the hot metal and the colours that would be up on the screen. And the idea that it is familial, the idea that it is communal, the idea that we are together in this activity is definitely part of the way that that, that little paragraph opens up memory, which is both individual for the author and also shared within um, the community that can hear that on a day like today. So this idea also of suggesting that these lantern slides, which, which give us more information, give us extras, um, give us the extra clips, also pull us back right to the beginning of a story that we know, right to the beginning of his dark materials, to the second chapter of Northern Lights. That's what I'm interested in and what I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes talking to you about. When we're in that chapter, we find our first trepan skull. So it is actually also a way in which we're moving around in terms of what we've been thinking about today. It's a very important chapter, as I'm sure you know. Um, it's where we set up an awful lot of the activity of the, uh, of the plot lines of the novels. But when Lord Asriel is showing these particular slides to the scholars in Jordan College, two things are important. One is the man-made manipulation of technologies and of scientific explorations. So we need the filter uh, in order to be able to see <coughs> dust on these slides. And the, the, the novel explains to us that a special emulsion has been tested, and this is the first time that it's working, um, in order to let us see differently, to let us see anew. And we also, in that, in that particular early chapter, are, have it very clearly mapped out to us that there are also political strategies being played out between the members of this community. So we can think about the ways in which that also is a set of strategies and a set of, of, of manipulations. The slides themselves show us dust settling on the adult, and then they go on to show us this remarkable opportunity that sets the quest for the trilogy, if you like, of the city in the stars, of the city from another world. And that's what we are told that can be seen on the final slide. But I'd like you to be curious, and I'd like you to go back to your copies of his dark materials, or indeed just to Blackwell's and have a quick flick through, and see what we actually see in that chapter. And what you see at the opening of that chapter is a little image actually produced by the author himself. Um, you can discover the page through using the 2007 lantern slides to take you back to re-experience or experience for uh, the first time, if you've been flicking through in, in, in a non-linear fashion, this second chapter of Northern Lights, where the story opens with a little image of a slightly more unpolished, artisanal, if you like, sketch of a magic lantern and what it's doing is showing you the hand turning it on and that's remarkable isn't it the man-made quality and suddenly the light is opening out and then this tiny little box framed thumb sketch that's what you're seeing the light from the magic lantern so you're seeing something that is illuminating <coughs> the story illuminating the page and something that in 2007 we might have a little bit more information as to why this might be personal for the author himself, that it might be reminding him of his own past childhood. But we know now about shadow particles, we know that that's what Mary Malone calls dust. And if we think now about the way in which this picture, this illustration works in the second um, chapter of Northern Lights, this idea of the magic lantern that can illuminate or light up the page. But what do you do when you do that on a page? not on a screen. You light up text, you light up print. The text is dark, we see it better 
because of this light. But hang on, that's the blank page that's actually foregrounding the ink, foregrounding the darkness. So we have this little black and white illustration where the, it's boxed in, it looks like it's, it's there for gaining kind of perspectival depth, so we think it's from another space and it's, it's opening up, illuminating this space, ink on a blank white page. The magic lantern and ink becoming the light source, if you like, something composed blank becoming history, the same idea of the photographic negative of what is, what is white reversing to what is black, because presumably this idea of breaking through with light and breaking through with blackness, which we will then fill with black text, is the same thing of similarity and difference, the same of breaking through with a window, a trepanning, a new breaking of the frame. And ultimately, of course, what is so delightful is that the ink hasn't given you light. What the ink has done is put one line going upwards and one line going do downwards so that you have the, the kind of the cone or the, or the, or the arc. So as, as you read in on, from here, the light goes this way to, to illuminate the page, but it, it actually just has one line of blackness there and one line of blackness there. It's like two storylines or multiple storylines that look like they're going apart. Ultimately, of course, they may well conjoin at some point in time in the text, if not in his dark materials itself, at least in one of the lantern slides where Coleman talks about this idea about the way that storylines go apart but will come together to touch at some point in time. He's broken the frame, he's broken the division, he's done it right from the beginning of his storytelling in this no novel. For what is the use of a book without pictures, you might ask yourselves. But please, I would, I would um, ask you, go back and have another look at Pullman's own illustrations in book one and indeed in book two of, of his dark materials and see what you think. See the way in which in this particular chapter he's suggesting that technology will assist vision and also will help the storyteller to tell the tale, that, that idea of the hand again that's going to turn on this illumination. And a vision, if you like, not necessarily of a city in the sky, but of a quest narrative that can last all time. An imaginative stimulus. Dark materials, indeed. Thank you.